Well, for those of you who are at home and those that are here, we are privileged, <clears throat> one, to be in the presence of the Lord, and two, to be in the presence of each other. We have fellowship here. We love the church. And, you know, we just finished worshiping and, and singing unto the Lord. And I hope that as we study God's word, and as we study Jesus and what he had to say, that it refines us, he, he makes us more like him, and he gives us a, an understanding of his unquestionable authority, and that he gives us an understanding of the love, the great love that he had for us. You know, many times in this Gospel of Luke, we'll find that people are trying to trap Jesus, and he really just wants us to know him. And so I hope that as you open up the scriptures, as I open up the scriptures, man, it's humbling, but that God would speak to us and that he would, he would touch our hearts so that we could be practical on the bus, <laughs> at the school, in the prisons, with our children, on the way home tonight, that we have the joy of the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's excellent, it's pure, it's true, it's alive, it's living and active and powerful. And Lord, we thank you that although they tried to trap you, you gave the truth and you stood for the truth and you lived a life, a sacrificial life. In this last week, as we look at your life, Jesus, may we look at our uh, surroundings and people around us and those that are lost around us and those that are challenging us or uh, just even our own sin. Lord, the, that we would just look to you, that you would refine us, that you would purify us, that you would uh, burn away the chaff, that you would refine us by your fire. Lord, we love you and ask that you speak powerfully. Lord, we can't wait to see what you're going to teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last, last week, we kind of left off 45 through 48 of chapter 19. Jesus cleansed the temple. If you remember the Gospel of John, Jesus cleansed the temple. This is the second account. Why would he do that? Well, in Jesus' time, there were people who would travel all over the world to Jerusalem to make an offering. Now, something significant about that is that they had to cover a lot of ground and many of them did bring a goat or a bull or a turtle dove or they, they brought something. But when they would come to the temple, what was treacherous is that the temple tax or the temple priest would examine their offering. And if they thought there was a blemish in it, they would make them pay an exorbitant amount to buy one of the temple approved offerings. And then they would kind of confiscate that person's animal. And then just a few days or weeks or hours or moments later, the next person in line or a few people down the road, they would then somehow find that the offering the other person was making was now unblemished. And so there was a corruption. And this was a stumbling point. Jesus had had enough. Now, not only that, they would come from different countries and you would see that they would have to use the, the shekel of the temple. And so the money changers, we see that they would shortchange people. They would charge a fee that would amount to probably the equivalent of two hours of wages for people. So they were ripping people off $20 here, $20 there, like a financing fee. Now, in today's modern age, a lot of the churches, you know, you can bank draft, you can give cash, you can write a check, you can do all of those things. But in this way, they were causing a stumbling block because people were like, I just want to give to God. I just want to worship God. And instead, they were being stumbled, kind of like we saw a couple weeks ago and this week in our Old Testament study. Phinehas and Hophni, the sons of Samuel, they were like taking the offering and before it had boiled and they were sleeping with the women at the, um, these sons of Eli rather, they were making people not want to come to the temple or to the tabernacle because they were so wicked. They were greedy and they were lustful. Well, Jesus, he went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it because he knew they were corrupt. And he said to them, it is written my house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. And they were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So they wanted, the, the people were gonna lose their power, their money, their position when he confronted their bold face hypocrisy and their greediness. So they didn't like him, they wanted to kill him, but the people loved him so much and hung on every word that he said. So, but Jesus, you gotta understand, is very passionate about us not stumbling one another 
not stumbling outsiders, people uh, who are wanting to believe. They should look at our lives and see the love of Christ. They should see a desire to please God. They should see that if they want to give to God, great, but there's not this compulsion. It should be led by the Spirit. So especially not for outward appearances. It's not about status. It's not about, well, if you give, then you should be acknowledged. No, that doesn't matter. Jesus wants the people of God from all over the world to not be stumbled when they come to the temple. And he said, this is, this is terrible. You're making it a den of thieves. It's like people who want to rip people off feel welcome here. That's terrible. So he had a lot to say. And Jesus, meek and mild, a lot of times we think, oh, you know, he was just this really nice guy. Yeah, but he got very angry and he dealt with sin. And he wanted it eradicated. He raised his voice. He lifted the table. He shouted. He made a whip, it says in the Gospel of John. He was furious. But he was righteous in that indignation. He did not sin in that anger, unlike many of us. All of us, we sin in our anger. It ought not be so. But that was his reasoning. He said, you know, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. People should come here. They should be feeling welcome to commune with God, not stumbled by greediness. Now it happened. On one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests and the scribes, together with the elders, confronted him. And they spoke to him, saying, us, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? So, Obviously, they knew Jesus was doing some things. One, he was driving out money changers. Two, he was healing every disease and people that were lame and blind and sick and ill. And, and Jesus was doing incredible work. So they said, okay, so we know he's doing things. But he said, by what authority that the leaders are like, what, who gives you the right? right? Who gives you the right to come in here? But notice what he's doing in verse 1 there. He's teaching and preaching the good news, the gospel. So I think it's important that we understand when Jesus was busy doing what his father's will was, and that's proclaiming like liberty to the captives, the good news, forgiveness of sins, welcoming people into the kingdom. There's the enemy right there trying to throw that authority away or, or to push him down or to subvert his work. Now, this is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus explaining the gospel, the good news, how people can be made right with God. And the scribes and Pharisees are so off base, they're just trying to derail him. So they said, what authority have you been doing these things? Or, or who gave you this authority? Now, Jesus had every right to say, read them the right act and, and to say, I'm God. I'm the son of God. And you should believe me no matter what. He had the authority, but guess what he does instead? In a masterful way, he answers them and he said, I also ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? So Jesus, instead of answering their question, where did your authority come from? He could have easily answered that from the father. You've heard me. You've seen me. I've done it. He said, I've got a question for you. Jesus, in a way, is putting them in a predicament. He says, I'll ask you one thing. Where did John's baptism come from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then you, did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered. And they, they said that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So Jesus was being challenged what authority do you have? He could have easily said, you know, I, I've already told you. In John chapter 8, he said, I only do what I see the Father doing. Before Abraham was, I am. They picked up stones to stone him in John chapter 8. But here he's just saying, hey, let me, let me talk about something real quick. You tell me who gave the authority or, or where John the Baptist's message, where his baptism came from. So what's interesting about the baptism, the washings, the, it wasn't just a ritual cleansing, like a bathtub kind of cleansing that the priest would do if you were a Jew. This was a baptism of repentance. John the Baptist had a hard message because he said, look, you need to repent and turn and change your mind. 
you need to change your mind and show deeds that are, are worthy of repentance. Like you brood of snakes, you vipers, you Pharisees and scribes. Show deeds. Prove it. You're not a child of Abraham just because you say you are. God can raise the children of Abraham from these rocks. He said, show with your deeds that you actually are sorry and change your mind and change your actions. So John's message was change, repent, change your mind. And the kingdom of, of God is at hand. He said, every valley will be raised. Every mountain will be made low. Every crooked path made straight. Behold, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. His baptism was to be prepared for the Lord. And here the Lord is in their very midst and they weren't prepared for him. Instead, they're trying to trap him. And so he's like, okay, hold on a second. Was John from heaven or was he not? Because if they weren't willing to receive John, they're not going to be willing to receive him. Just like Jesus says, if they weren't willing to receive Moses, they wouldn't receive him because Moses wrote of Jesus. So he said, you're of your father, the devil, in John 8. So here he's saying, hey, one or the other. You can't have it both ways. Is John the Baptist from heaven or from men? And they knew that they wanted to say that John was from heaven. But if they did that, they're, they're blasted. They are, their cover is gone. Because now they shouldn't be upset with Jesus at all. So instead, they say, we don't know. And they were trapped in their unbelief. And Jesus says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. If you're asking me a question about my authority and you can't even answer a basic truth about John the Baptist, who everybody knows is a prophet, then why are, what are we talking about here? So what does that look like today? Well, with Jesus, a lot of people want to say Jesus is a good teacher. He was a good man. He was this, he was that. Well, as C.S. Lewis and some other apologists will say, either he was a liar, a lunatic, or he is the Messiah. He's the son of God. So either Jesus lied about everything, and this is all fabricated, or he's a lunatic and crazy, or Jesus really is, like he said, going to die on the cross. He died on the cross. He really is the son of God who would be raised from the grave. He was raised from the grave. Either that's true or it's not. And so you can't have it both ways. And so today, a lot of people try to have Jesus in this little corner. I'm sorry, Jesus is alive, amen? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, amen? He is not controlled by you or me or by the world that thinks that they understand him or they wanna minimize him, no. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He had all authority, and I love Matthew 28 where he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples. So he's saying, all authority has been given to me. He confirms it in Matthew 28. It's all over the place. He accepts worship as we see uh, just a couple chapters ago, right? The Samaritan and other people worship him. Son of David, the, the leper or the blind person worships him. Jesus received worship. He has all authority. And yet religious people reject him. So to expound on that, to give them a little bit more of a in-your-face warning, to tell them a story they probably knew very well, but to maybe make it more personal to them, Jesus unpacks another parable. And he says, then he, be, he, he told the people a parable, a certain man planted a vineyard and he leased it out to vine dressers, husbandmen, tenants. And he went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time, harvest time, he sent his servant to the vine dressers that he might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and they sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, sent him away empty handed. And again, he sent a third, sent out a third and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then, the owner of the vineyard. He said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? 
It's pretty suspenseful. So the story as it goes, many a men would either plant a field, wheat, oats, barley, harvest, or on these hilled and rocky terrained terrace of, of fields that men would have all over Israel today. You have these terraced gardens of sorts, or even you see them in Cowley County area near on your way down to Winfield off of I-77. You see them in the Flint Hills sometimes. You see, but the idea of rocky, hilly soil, they would build a terraced area uh, and they would plant vineyards. And in the vineyards, they would also build a wine press of sorts or a building. They would have um, a lookout, so to speak, and they would have a wall. But these terraced areas, the rich man had a lot of land. There were so many stones in Israel. Jesus was using a, a language and an idea and a concept. They're probably walking down the road throughout the days and weeks and leading up to that time. His disciples had seen many a vineyard. But he's talking to the, to the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees saying, hey, this rich man, he had this vineyard and he was a busy man. He was a business man and he let people lease it out. He let people rent the land so they could make a profit. And when he went to collect his dues, because he owned it, when he went to collect what was due to him, you guys, the, the tenants killed and beat and disgraced the servants. So what is this Jesus is saying? He's telling them, I'm just talking about the surface of the story. He's telling them the story to evoke an emotional, invoke an emotional response to them that that's terrible. I can't believe it. This is wicked, right? Why would they beat the servants and, and then kill his only son or kill his heir? And so there, verse 15, he says, therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? I'm sure they were all thinking he should destroy them. He should stone them to death. He should have vengeance on them. And he says, Jesus answers his own question and says, he will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Then he looked at them and he said, what then is this that is written? Psalm 118, 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So here's the key. He's telling this parable. They know it's a parable. They know he's telling a figurative story. They already sense that he's coming right at them because they just tried to trap him to say he didn't have any authority. And now he's saying, hey, let me tell you about authority. This vine dressing owner, this, this man that owned some land, he had authority. And look how people treated that authority. They trounced it. They killed his servants. They, they cast him out and then they killed his son. As we look at the spiritual implications here, God is saying, I sent the prophets, okay? We have Elijah, Tishbite. We have Elisha. We had Isaiah. We had Jeremiah. We see that the scriptures say some of these were sawn in two. Isaiah, as, as tradition says, was sawn in two. We have another, uh, Jeremiah was stoned to death. He was thrown in prison. I don't know if you remember in Jeremiah, uh, in the story of Jeremiah, that he went to Tophanes or uh, Egypt. He didn't want to, he wanted to stay in Jerusalem. And he ended up getting stoned to death. This, he was naked and, and blunt, uh, naked and barefoot, walking throughout the land, trying to tell the people of, it, of Judah, hey, do not trust in Egypt because you will end up naked and barefoot. He who trusts in Egypt is like a man who puts his weight up against a reed and it pierces through his hand because the reeds of Egypt prior to the Aswan Dam being built a few decades ago, so he was saying, don't trust in them. Trust in the Lord. God's dealing with you. He's exiling the nation to Babylon. So he was a prophet, just like Jesus is saying. He was one of the servants and they beat him. They treated him shamefully. They sent him away empty handed. Uh, he sent a third one. They wounded him, casted him out. They sent all these, these prophets away empty handed. And then the owner of the vineyard, verse 13, said, what shall I do? I shall send my beloved son. Beloved, 
son that they will probably respect when they see him. So this is Jesus. He's saying, hey, that's me, guys. The owner of the field. Now, Jesus, Jesus is using symbolism. The vineyard, the fig tree, the vineyard. This is also symbolic of the nation of Israel. So he's saying, hey, Israel, God has sent you prophets. And now God has sent you his beloved son. And you kill him. They hadn't killed him yet. But their thoughts, like we see in the Sermon on the Mount, they had already committed murder in their heart. They wanted Jesus dead. So he, he's foretelling that. He's foreshadowing that. He's prophesying that. And he says, what will this owner of the vineyard do? He'll cast them out of the vineyard and kill them. He killed them. Therefore, or what will he do? He'll destroy those vine dressers, verse 16, and give the vineyard to others. Notice these Religious people are like, certainly not. You're not going to give away what belongs to us to others. But Jesus was, was making it clear to them. Yes. What does that mean? The Jews should have been ready to receive Jesus, but instead, God was going to ransack Jerusalem. He was going to allow Titus to destroy Jerusalem. And then he was going to give inheritance. He was going to give salvation to the Gentiles. And he started the church among the Gentiles. And notice in verse 17, he said, what do you think it means in Psalm 118, the, the prophecy, the messianic prophecy that you guys delight in so much that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. As we look at Psalm 118, we looked at it a couple weeks ago, but the interesting thing is Jesus is saying clearly a cornerstone is what you build everything else upon, right? Cornerstone, it's the, it's the capstone. In many ways, the cornerstone might be on an archway. It's the, the capstone is the middle. It holds everything together. It's the most strong piece. On a building, it might be the very corner of which you set both foundations for the long side, the short side of a building. You look at this verse 22, um, Verse 23 goes on to say, this was the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in, in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Note that when he was coming in on a donkey, like we talked about last week, the triumphant entry, that's what Jesus was talking about. The day that the Lord ordained, he had marked it down to the very moment Remember, 483 years after the prophecy, we read Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. It said that from the time of the, the command to restore and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, there will be 60 and nine sevens. So there are 483 years from the time that Artaxerxes had made that commission. That was the day Jesus came in. That's the same Psalm 118 that refers to this is the day the Lord has made. And unfortunately, the, the stone which the builders rejected, the stone that was, Jesus is the cornerstone, right? We are built up in a holy inhabitation of God. The apostles and the prophets built upon Jesus, who is the chief cornerstone. We are all built upon who he is. And he says, this is, you guys are the builders. You're rejecting the chief cornerstone. But note verse 18, here's the solution. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. Like if you just put all your, all your trust in me, you'll be broken of your sin. And, and brokenness is what David says, that broken and contrite spirit. You'll be repentant. You'll change your mind. You'll follow after me. You'll believe in me. You'll have faith toward me. But whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now Jesus would say here, he didn't want to fall on, on them with judgment. He wanted them to repent, but he's saying, look, this is a stiff judgment that's coming. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour, they, laid hand, they, they sought to lay hands on him. They feared the people. He had spoken this parable against them and they knew it. So Jesus was, this is what I love about Jesus. Either you love him or you hate him. <laughs> Either you have passed from judgment, from death to life, or you're still under the condemnation. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. 
Jesus accepted that wrath, took that punishment for us so that we don't have to take it. But here, pride, religious, spiritual pride on their part and blindness and unbelief would cause them to be ground to powder. And unfortunately, in a, in a real physical sense, they were, they were butchered and, and killed and stabbed and, and burned down to the ground. After 30 years later. So you'd think they, they might be in awe of what he just said. Okay, maybe we should think about what Jesus said. Maybe, maybe he's the stone. Maybe we should fall upon him. Maybe we should call upon him and believe on him. No, they actually had another plan. They're like, let's trap him again. So they watched him. And they sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they may seize on his words in order to, to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. Notice, they're trying to trap Jesus and get him in trouble with the government. He's saying, I want to know whose authority, John the Baptist, who gave him the authority, because you're challenging me, but I want to know who gave John his power. They couldn't answer that. Now they're like, hey, we need to get him in trouble with the government, so we know the government will do the dirty work. We, we can get the government to, to trap Jesus. We can destroy him that way. Then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and that you do not show personal favoritism, but you teach the way of God in truth. Now that sounds really nice, and it's indeed true, but it was being said by some liars. So they said, we know, that was the lie. They said, we know that you say and teach rightly. Yes, Jesus never told a lie. He never taught anything incorrect. And we know that you do not show personal favoritism. Jesus does not show favoritism. He asks that we all put our faith in him. He doesn't play favorites. He just wants us all to come to him like children. But you teach the way of God in truth. Jesus would say, I am the way, the life, and the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So these men pretending to be righteous, they try to trap Jesus, and this is the question. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they figured if he says, no, it's not lawful, then Caesar and the Romans will destroy and, and throw him in prison or have him killed or crucified and take care of that. What's interesting is in the time of the Romans, if we just look at history, and even if we look today, some 55 or 65,000 miles of road were constructed by the Romans. And many of them still exist today because they're made out of marble or limestone or rock. And to, to this day, cities like Caesarea Maritime, you can see the, the buildings, the remnants, the obelisks, the Colosseums. You can see the literal stones in Jerusalem that date back to the time of Jesus, massive. You can see the roads that connected the known world. This forced peace, Pax Romana, the Romans enforced a peace that allowed Israel to be relatively calm. As many wars and battles had occurred over Israel during the Roman Empire, it was relatively calm because the Romans had subjected the known world under their thumb, under their authority. So when we look at this, they had to exact a tax from the people. Unfortunately, like we saw with the tax collector, with Zacchaeus, just a couple chapters ago, just the last chapter actually, Zacchaeus and many of the tax collectors were taking an exorbitant amount from the Jews. So they hated the idea of being abused and mistreated and overly taxed. I mean, no one likes to be taxed, right? This time of year, no one likes to pay more than what they ought to. Now, if he would say, no, they should, it is lawful, you should pay taxes, then they would trap him and say, aha, because in their book, that would be showing allegiance to the Roman Empire. That would be showing um, 
that Jesus did not care about their, their plight and that he, uh, in a way, would make the Jews more angry than anything. Now, politics have a way of polarizing people, making people angry. And this is what they knew. So they made it, well, you gotta tell us, is it this way or is it that way? And Jesus had a wonderfully masterful response to them. He perceived their craftiness and he said to them, and I love this, why do you test me? Remember, when Jesus was taken out into the wilderness in Matthew chapter four, he said to the devil, you shall, uh, man does not live, Matthew 4, 4, he says, turn these stones into bread. Man, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He says, throw yourself down, for he has commanded his, is Psalm 91, he has commanded his angels to have charge over you that they may bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. They don't want you to get hurt. Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So one, we don't live on every, every we won't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but you're not to tempt the Lord your God. You know, you can jump off the roof of a building and say, God, please protect me. But that's kind of testing the Lord, tempting the, like, why? Some people, they want to be reckless and then blame God when things don't work out. No, that's not the way it works. So Jesus, in a sense here, he's saying, why are you tempting or testing me? And no, at the end of the, the temptations in Matthew 4, Satan says, bow down and worship me. And because he had all the kingdoms to give, but Jesus, he said, get behind me, Satan, or get away. For you shall love the Lord or worship the Lord and serve him only. So Jesus knew the, the enemy's tactics. And in a way, the way Satan tempted Jesus, the people are now trying to tempt Jesus. And what they said here is nothing short of just, hey, we want to make you look bad. We want the, either the government to hate you or the Jews to hate you, one or the other. I, we don't care. We just want people to kill you. We want to get rid of you. He said, why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? And they answered and said, Caesar's. I don't know if it's Kaiser or Caesar or different things, but say Caesar. And he said to them, I don't want to read this yet. Let's pause. So a denarius was one day's wages. So probably the equivalent of $100, $150 today. Probably like a silver dollar today, right? So silver dollars are 50 bucks, 40 bucks, sometimes more, 60, 100 bucks. I don't know. But the idea is, look at that coin. On one side of the coin, you have the face of the emperor. So only the emperor of Rome was able to mint gold and silver coins at that time. So on one end, you have his face. On the other, like the heads. On the tail end of the coin, you had a picture of him kind of leaning back, sitting in a chair in a robe or toga, so to speak. So what's interesting is the very first and second commandment in Exodus chapter 20 is, I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And you also shall create no graven image, right? No icons, no idols, no image. And note that even on our dollar bills and coins and what Jesus is saying is, okay, you guys got some coins on you, but what's on the coin? It's an image. Oh, okay. So you all are coming after me and you're carrying around money with the image of a man or a ruler or a king who's not me. Okay, now that we know that now, that, now that the air is clear and we understand. What's interesting though, Pontius Pilate got himself into trouble a couple times. And if I can recall, on one occasion, he, in Jerusalem, he set up some images near the temple. And the Jews were so incensed. I think it was Caesarea Maritime, but anyways, he rounded them up into the, it's there today, but this Colosseum in Caesarea. And he said to them, 
if you want me to, because he set up some bronze, some bronze uh, shields in the temple, and he also sent up, or he set up these images. Well, when it was in Caesarea Maritime, he said to the people, hey, these images, I'm not going to get rid of them. And they said, you must get rid of them. And he said, well, if that's what you insist, then I will slit your throats. If that's, if that's the way you feel, I'm not getting rid of them. And all, what they did very much surprised him. But the Jews there in Caesarea Maritime, Maritima, they laid down and they exposed their neck. They said, get it over with. Let's do it. Because we love God so much and we don't want to worship idols or icons or images that we are willing to die for this. So he changed his mind. He decided not to do it. He got rid of those images, got rid of those idols. Another occasion where he set up these bronze uh, shields and he kind of in a way was desecrating the temple. The Jews in Jerusalem didn't even bother confronting him. They just wrote the emperor and they said, this is what Pontius Pilate was doing. And so... In a sense, it put him in hot water. So as we get to the, the actual passion of Christ where he's being tried before Pontius Pilate, he was, Pilate had already been on thin ice. He had already had his run-ins with the Jewish people because he was not a believer in the one true God. And he was an idolater and they kind of despised him for that and it got him into political trouble. So Jesus, knowing how zealous, just like Saul when he was a Pharisee, these Jews, these scribes, these Pharisees, they were very zealous. And they're like, I hate the government, right? Anti-government. We hate the Romans. They're so, you know, we want God's kingdom. But then the hypocrisy of that is they had more peace under the Romans than they had ever enjoyed. And so Jesus kind of turns this all around and he says, look, Render or give unto Caesar, give therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's and to God the things which are God's or that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people and they marveled at his answer and kept silent. Now Jesus turned around their question that they said, should we pay taxes or should we not? Jesus said, look, as we'll see in uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 12, 13, We'll see in a couple other passages, I think second uh, Peter, but in Corinthians it says that God has appointed the rulers and the authorities. And here we have, uh, Jesus is basically saying, give to the government what they, what they deserve. Give them... Uh, Give them what is absolutely necessary. They deserve taxes. They are appointed to punish the wicked doer, as Paul will say in Corinthians. They are to commend those who do what is right. They don't wield the sword in vain. We are to reverence, as Peter would say, rulers, kings, lords. Today we would say governors, prime ministers, presidents, even if we don't agree with. The point is he's saying, you give to the government what belongs to the government, like money, time. You give to God what belongs to God, and that is worship, honor. So what is Jesus saying? In a way, one apologist would say, he's kind of saying, whose image is on you? But Jesus is saying, you give the government what they deserve, he didn't say give them more than what they deserve. He did not say give them less than what they deserve. But render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. The Roman Empire and those who, even the lowest person in the Roman Empire, enjoyed, even, even though there was slavery, there was oppression, the lowest person in the Roman Empire had access to roads, to language, to libraries, to Koine Greek, to technology, to rights or lack thereof, but they, they had a, a court of law. They had different due processes. Those take money. One of the most important things with government is that they keep the roads. They keep the utilities going. They have some sort of, as much as people want to defund or change the funding of police, 
They have a way of policing and punishing the wicked doers. So Jesus is saying, look, that has to keep happening. But ultimately, as 1 Peter 3.22 says, he who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him, Jesus knows that all of those authorities, all of those governments are subject to him, and he is the one who rules. So ultimately, if you rebel against government, you're rebelling against Jesus who has authority over that government. What about Mao Zedong? What about Hitler? What about, okay. Jesus is saying simply this. Give to God what belongs to God. Worship God. If the government is asking you for taxes, big whoop. Worship God, right? They get their 10%. They get their 20%. They get whatever they get. God has a way. He owns it all. And he has a way of taking care of us. And this, this is very convicting to people who are so anti, anti, anti-government. Look, anarchy or dictatorship is not better necessarily. And we are awaiting a coming king. Amen? Jesus, who rules in the heavens at the right hand of the Father, will rule on earth and will rule in heaven forever. And hopefully he's already ruling in your heart today, in my heart today. So he dealt with this question, this trapping. It's interesting. They're like, you are so good. You never say anything wrong. You teach the way of truth. Oh, by the way, should we pay taxes? It's like, you guys, come on now. Pay your taxes, love God, worship God. It's simple. So the Sadducees, there were some of the Sadducees who denied that there is a resurrection. They came to him and asked him, saying, teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and he died without children. And the second took her for a wife and he died, he died childless. And then the third took her and in like manner, the seven also. And they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she become? For all seven had her as wife. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed this in the burning bush passage, that the dead are raised when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after that, they dared not question him anymore. Okay, raise your hand if you realize that Jesus has all the answers. Right? I don't have to question him like they're questioning him. They dared not question him to entrap him. They dared not question him as though he was just a man. They dared not question him because it just made them look bad, foolish, ignorant, prideful, and wicked. All of these things. I do think, I do know that Jesus taught us a few chapters ago that you must be like a little child to inherit the kingdom. So questions are great. So Jesus would want us and wants us to question him. But notice the Sadducees drummed up one of the funniest stories you ever heard, right? Well, first you got this guy, then he marries a woman, then she cooks real bad and he dies. <laughs> they don't say it exactly like that. But then, well, oh, that next brother marries her and he comes up to, the, to, to ba the base and he strikes out too, he's dead too. And then the third brother, then the fourth, and you wouldn't believe it, all seven brothers die. Then the woman dies. It's like, okay, I guess I'll follow you on this story. Now the story, as we know, we just studied on Sundays, the story of Ruth, you have Elimelech die, and Naomi 
as Orpah and Ruth, these daughter-in-laws, and you know, Malon and Kilion both die, or Malon, and his bride, Ruth, she decides not to go back to the Moabites, to her home, and she follows Naomi all the way back to Bethlehem, and then you have a Goel, or a kinsman redeemer, and this man named Obed, or sorry, not Obed, but, um, I'm so sorry, Boaz, who they then, Ruth and Boaz have Obed. Thank you very much, James. Boaz rescues her. Boaz is that brother who, or the next of kin. Very good. Now that's a beautiful story. This is just like them out there on a limb throwing out a, a ridiculous story. But the reason why they threw it out there is because they, they were thinking that the resurrection seems to be ridiculous. Now, you can easily remember what a Sadducee is because they are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. They think that this life is all there is. They are the people you could call Stoics. They are the people who say, you know, eat and drink. Well, no, that's Epicureans. But the Stoics would be like, there's nothing. Life is just meaningless. You know, you die and that's all there is. And they are miserable. Now, as Paul addresses on Mars Hill, the Epicureans and the Stoics, you know, there's Epicureans who are saying, hey, carpe diem, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die, seize the day. So that's the opposite there. But interestingly, the Sadducees and Pharisees rubbed shoulders with one another, and they liked the power. They liked Moses. They liked the Pentateuch. They memorized the scriptures. Who cares, right? Because they ultimately they were missing the point, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection that we already get a foretaste of in this life. We've passed from death to life. So what Jesus basically said to them, hey, let me give you a lesson. <laughs> They're saying, therefore, in the resurrection, who's, who's married to who here, right? No kids. All these guys had her. He's like, okay, hold on. Verse 34, Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Like, you know how it is on earth. People, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. That was the, basically the main first major commandment in the Bible. The very first institution created by God was the family, Adam and Eve. So looking at that, Jesus cites that and he says, look, People get married. They're given in marriage right now. You're seeing it in this age. But those who are counted worthy to attain to that age, he's talking about the age to come, the, the life hereafter, when you're in an eternal state, in a place where there is no more sin, there is a glorified body, 1 Corinthians 15, and as we read in Thessalonians, the rapture, but 1 Corinthians 15, a new incorruptible body. You're in eternity. So he says, therefore... Those who attain to that life, the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Guess what? God doesn't need people to have babies once they're already in heaven. That's main part, the main part of marriage on earth is to have children and to represent Christ and the church and the relationship between God, Jesus, the Son, and us, the bride of Christ, and how he married us, or how, how he, the mystery, as Paul says in Ephesians, of Christ in the church, I believe it's Ephesians 5. So here, he says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, that flies in the face of the Mormon doctrine or the Islamic doctrine that says you'll have multiple wives or that you'll inhabit new, new, new planets. The Mormons teach that in one of their books. So he's saying, no, that's not what heaven's about. But those who are counted worthy to attain this age, the resurrection from the dead, they're neither married nor are given to marriage, nor can they die anymore. They're immortal. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So they're never gonna die. They're eternal beings at that point. Now, eternity has been put in our hearts already. And we all will spend eternity. God has his plan for us in that eternity. But he's saying you're going to be like the angels in that 
you know, what's the hurry? I have, we have six activities going on right now with five children or, you know, and, and it's, it's hard to keep up and it's all good, but that's in heaven. We're all children of God in heaven. Uh, we will be known as we are known. We will know others as they are known. It's interesting. It's like, will Camden see you as grandma and you as mom? And, and, but I'll see you as like a friend. And, and so will we have, will we know people as their, our moms and brothers and sisters? Yeah, I think we'll know more than we know now. He'll create, he'll make all things new, but we will not become less intelligent. That's for sure. But I think it's interesting is the, the way we'll be known by the Lord, but also amongst each other. We all have a special relationship to one to another. And there are certain people that God's put in your life that are extra special. But we're gonna have all eternity to get to know one another. It's just an awesome thing. And it's sad, you see. It's sad, you see, for them to miss out on that. And so Jesus is kind of saying, look, no, it's like the angel, you know, there's angels. They didn't believe in angels or the resurrection. Isn't that sad? So they didn't believe in it. So we need to know there are angels. We need to know that, as Jesus said, each, uh, their face is always beholding the Father in heaven. There's guardian angels, there's archangels, there's cherubs, which are these four creatures at the throne of God that have four heads, you know. But angels are awesome, right? But all the more awesome, we're sons and daughters of God. So he's explaining this. Can't die anymore. Yeah. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. When he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, or Isaac, and the God of Yaakov or Jacob, okay? I like that God pays attention to even the verb tenses. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Let's look at verse 37 there. Exodus 3, 1 through 6. If you want to turn in Exodus 3, Verses one through six, that gives you a little context of what Jesus is referring to here. And I'm sure they knew Exodus three very, very well. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. He was the priest of Midian, Jethro was. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and he came to Oreb, the mountain of God. Oh, wow. This is in Saudi Arabia. I'm gonna post something tonight. If you guys look on Facebook, oh, it's really cool. But they've found where this mountain is. It's, it's charred black, and when you chip away at the, the rocks, like tan, but it's like the top of this mountain is black to this day. It's where the Ten Commandments were given. It's in Saudi Arabia to this day. Everything checks out. There's a place where there's uh, 12 wells of water, and I think it's like 28 date palms, or whatever the, the account is in the Bible. They found the 12 springs of water. They're in Saudi Arabia. A lot of the wandering and wilderness and the Gulf of Aqaba where the Israelites really crossed when they left Egypt. So anyways, this is where Moses is at. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will go turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush, bush will not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, Notice he was curious. God called to him from the midst of the bush and he said, Moses, Moses. He said, here I am. Just like Samuel, remember? Here I am, your servant's listening. Here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. This place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, this is the key. Notice we didn't read it in the gospel, but I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look upon God. I am. Now we read about that also in John, where Jesus goes into all the I am. I'm the bread of life. I am the vine. I am the, the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the fountain of living waters. I am, I am, I am. And in John chapter 80, he also says, 
I am that I am. And looking at that, people picked up stones to stone him because they said, you're not even 50 years old and you say you've seen Abraham? He says, yes, before Abraham was, I am. So they wanted to kill him, but he slipped away. When we look at the, the burning bush passage there, when God says, I am the God of thy father or the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob, Jesus is quoting this because if Abraham was dead, Isaac was dead, and Jacob was dead and gone and annihilated, never to exist again, what would God have said to Moses, whom they revere? So pretend you're Moses. I was the God of your father. <laughs> right? We just celebrated May the 4th be with you, right? I, no, I am your father, right? But God would say, I was the God of Abraham. He's long gone. No. God's very name, the Lord, the Yahweh or the Tetragrammaton, the YHVH that we see in English, it literally means the all becoming one. He is everything you need. He's always what you need. He's that essence of who he is. But notice he says, I am. Not I was, not I will be. I am. God is beyond our dimension of time. He's beyond the realm of what we can understand. He's not bound by our realms. And the Sadducees, it's very sad when we try to put God within our boundaries and they're trying to put him into, into this cocoon of well, seven husbands and one wife and what happens. And he's like, look guys, you're missing it. You're gonna be like the angels. You're gonna live forever. You're never gonna die. Moses even said it when he recounted that God is the God of the living. You're going to be living forever. Come on now. You're going to live forever. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. All for all live to him. Wow, what a mystery. You mean all people on the entire planet? God's desire is that none should perish, but all come to repentance. Paul on Mars Hill, he's quoting a, a Greek philosopher. He says, in him we live and move and have our being, right? But here, he is a God of not the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees, they say, hey, teacher, you've spoken well. Hey, yeah, we believe in all that stuff. Heaven, living forever, that sounds great. Wait a minute, weren't they just trying to trap him? <laughs> it's amazing how fickle we are. But notice, they said, after that, they dare not question him anymore. Okay, John 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he's like, how can this be, being born again? What does that mean? It's like the wind. You can't see where it's coming from, where it's going. So it is with those who are born of the Spirit. He says, how can this be? Can I go into my mother's womb again and be born again? No, 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 no. You're born of the water. You're born of the fire. You're born of the flesh. You're born of the Spirit. You must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he's like, how can this be? You're a teacher of the religious law and you do not understand these things. He says, how will you believe me? I'm telling you of things we see, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the, the people on the street you're seeing being healed. Like you said, we know that you come from God because I'm doing these things. Just like those crooked people that were trying to trap him about the taxes just said, hey, we know you're perfect. But then he leaves Nicodemus with the thought of saying, if you don't believe me about things that you're seeing in your own life, people being, being set free, born again. How are you gonna believe me when I talk about heaven when no one's been up to heaven but me? So just like this, they got to a point where they're like, wow. So he's got authority and we were just challenging him on that. We don't even want, like this kind of a, uh, our flesh and the Pharisees were cowardly. They didn't wanna admit that John the Baptist was the real deal. You know, you kind of, you know the spirit of God when you see it. You know someone who's loving, He's got the joy of the Lord, peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. We see that. We know that we can see the, Holy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But they, they weren't ready. They dare not question him anymore. And he turns and he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Verse 41. 
Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls him Lord, or Adonai. How then is, how is he then his son? So in verse 42 there, he's quoting a Davidic psalm. He's quoting Psalm 110. Everybody knew that this was referring to the Messiah. As you look at Psalm 110, God is speaking to the Messiah. And he's saying, hey, I'm going to help you subdue, just like Psalm 2. I'm going to help you subdue your enemies. I'm going to make them a footstool. And that day is coming. In a way, a lot of ways, Jesus has already um, in that authority, but I believe when Jesus rules and reigns on the earth, that that will actually be a visual thing that we'll see. But Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, notice the Lord is the L-O-R-D, all capitalized, that's Yahweh, that's I am that I am, that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, said to my Lord, which notice that's not all capitalized on Psalm 110, verse 1, it's, it's Adonai. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then it says, the Lord shall send, your, send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. And that's when Jesus will rule from Zion. But here, David is saying that God, the God of the universe, all becoming one, said to my Lord, my master, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So he's like, hey, how could David recognize his master, if his master is his son, it must mean that Jesus came from eternity. He came from heaven. He came, he came beyond the realm of time because he's always existed. So kids will say, well, who made God? Well, God's always been. So that's a great question that our kids ask, and I love it. But David himself, he recognized that God was talking with his Lord, and he prophesied that. But yet, in Samuel... God gave a covenant to David that one of his descendants would rule and reign forever. So very clearly, David's descendant would be from everlasting to everlasting. He would be this mighty God, this Prince of Peace, this almighty, uh, you know, Prince of Peace, Father, everlasting Father, and the government would be upon his shoulders, and this, this would be God in the flesh. So David believed that his master, even though he would come out of his loins, that he existed before him. So Jesus is saying, therefore David calls him master or Lord, how then is he his son? <laughs> then in, he in the hearing of all the people he said to his disciples, now if they were dumbfounded before, think about how dumbfounded they are now. Like he's talked about the stone that the builders rejected, he's like, hey, that's me guys. I'm, I'm the most important thing you gotta build everything upon. Then he, he talked to them about, hey, uh, God is the God of the living, and even Moses knew that because when the burning bush happened, you know, God made it super clear. So how have you guys been wrong for this many hundreds of years? Like, come on, wake up. And then he goes on to say, oh yeah, and David's son was actually me because I existed before him. So, okay, now you gotta chew on those three major things. He's like, okay, let's have fun. He lets him squirm a little bit. Then he turns to his disciples, all the people, can hear him, but he's talking to his disciples and he says, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. Now the flesh and religious people want power, they want prestige, they wanna look good, they wanna be in these awesome places of recognition. But then he says, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense, they make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Well, there's a, a day of reckoning where God is going to deal with each of us. But he's already taken all the wrath that is due to you and me out upon Jesus on the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, he took our punishment. When God looks at us, he sees what we've done by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Anything that's not done by faith is sin. We want to be obedient to Christ, but what he's saying here to them is, 
these religious people, they're actually exploiting the people that pure religion, pure and undefiled religion, James says, is to take care of the orphans and the widows and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. One, they're greedy and they're taking advantage of the most vulnerable people on the earth. And unfortunately, I've seen it in religion where the, the man dies and the priest comes in and, and they fleece the widow and false teachers that are greedy, they, they attract followings after themselves. So this, he's warning that they, they pray long prayers, but he says, hey, beware. Beware of the scribes. They, they, wanna, they wanna be recognized. And, and remember how he said, you wanna take the place of least honor, you wanna take the humble seat? They, they don't, like they're blind to it, but they want to be honored. And God's desire is for us to just be like him, be like a servant, be like a child. And, and many of us, like in, the Pharisees were missing the boat here, the Sadducees were missing the power of the resurrection, the, these fake actors were missing the point of honoring God and paying your taxes. And at the end of all this, Jesus knows it all and he loves everyone. He wants them to come to know him and he leaves them with the thought of, hey, beware. Beware of those religious people. And I hope what you get is not religious. The goal of studying the Bible is not to be religious. The goal of coming to Glenville is not to be religious. The goal of coming to Glenville is, or to being in your Bible or to, it's every day I'm walking with the Lord and every day I'm saying, God, Jesus, you've always existed. You're here with me. I need your help. I need your guidance. Help me to love my enemies like you love them. Help me to walk the way you walked and help me to see the way you see and help me to worship and to, to rid me of myself, you know? Lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil, but, but help me to have the joy. And how do you have that joy? When you realize the first two words of the prayer, our Father. Remember what he said to the Sadducees? They're like the angels, but they're actually sons and daughters of God. They're sons of God. So the biggest thing that brings a smile to my face tonight, and hopefully for you all, is we're called children of God. Why? Because I'm a good person. I ain't killed nobody and I'd keep the commandments. No, <laughs> you're a child of God because what Jesus did for you, he took your place. You believe in him. You're not trying to trap Jesus. You're just saying, okay, you got the answers. I have no words like Isaiah. I'm undone, woe is me, I'm of unclean lips. He just said, I have seen the holy God of the universe and he had nothing to say other than he was in awe. The Lord touched his lips with a, a coal, a burning coal, and he went out and he, he declared what he had seen. Similarly, we come to God, we really have nothing to add to the equation. We just believe that Jesus did it for us. We believe that he did what he said he would do. He died, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, he rose from the grave. It's not really complicated. And he's always existed. That's a beautiful thing. Anyone who says that they believe the words of Jesus and they think you don't have to pay taxes, they just don't read. Anyone who doesn't believe in the afterlife, I hope that Jesus reveals that to them, that there is a life in the here or thereafter. Forever, you're gonna spend eternity. And God wants us to spend eternity with him. And the only way to do that is to recognize what David looked forward to. David, the adulterer, the murderer, the king, the battle, the, the bloodshed man. And that is that God, the God of the universe, said to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm gonna make your enemies a footstool. I'm going to set up a kingdom that will last forever through you, Jesus, and you need to bow your knee to that king. So the scriptures say all, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. The question is, why do people wait so long? And we have so much that we know about him. Why do we let other things become more important? As Jesus would say, beware of the Pharisees. Beware of religion putting anything in the way of you and Jesus. Beware of people who want to look 
really righteous. I'll tell you, I've got, I've got my issues. I need the Lord. I, I need Jesus. It's not, it's not even funny how much we need Jesus, how much I need Jesus, right? He is everything. He's it. So, Jesus said, beware of them. And remember, Jesus has all authority. I don't, you don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to a pastor. You don't have to go to a man of God, a seer, a prophet, a prophet that kind of thing. However, Jesus, as he said in that parable, he's, God sent prophets. And God sent his son to be the savior of the world. What we need to do is obey and follow his example and let the Holy Spirit lead us in everything. So do we fail? Do we fall short? Yes. Is there condemnation for those in Christ Jesus? No. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, Romans author, you know, chapter 7, he's saying, the good I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, I do. Who will rescue me from this body of death, this sin? Thank God the Lord Jesus rescues us. And it's, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we read in Romans 8 all these beautiful things. Nothing separates us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But here, the disciples, um, he's telling them, look out. Religion's not the key. Look, you got the Pharisees, you got these guys trying to trap me, you got these guys questioning my, my authority. Hey, at the end of the day, you want to be a son of God? You want to be a child of God? Then recognize who I am. So Jesus wants to be recognized more and more. I, I know that they tried to trap him, but as we see, they failed. And today... Satan would have us be distracted by whatever he could find for you. For the Sadducees, it was, well, well, this doesn't make sense. And they tried to logically make sense of, well, you know, since I don't believe in the resurrection, let me come up with a story that makes that, make God to look bad. No. If the Bible says it, if Jesus said it, if the word of God says it, I believe it. I may not understand it. There's still even things that I, I grapple with I don't fully understand. I do understand this. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of David, and Jesus is the King who will rule, and he's the stone which the builders rejected, and I don't have to be afraid, and I don't have to doubt, and I don't have to put any confidence in the flesh. I put all my confidence in what Jesus did for me. So on my bad days, on my good days, on my everything in between days, I can say, Jesus... Thank you for being my Lord. I need you today. Show me what to do. So, um, no, Jesus wasn't trying to trap people. <laughs> no, religious people were trying to trap Jesus. Note that religious people did not want to accept a real work of God that they could see in their very own lifetime in the life of John the Baptist. And there are going to be times where people just, they hate the work of God and we pray for our enemies. We love those who persecute us. We love them. God was good to the righteous and the wicked. He is good to the righteous and the wicked. So we need to pray for people who persecute us. When they spitefully use us, when they say all manner of evil against us falsely, Jesus has given us a good example. He talked with them. He explained the scriptures with them. And he embodied the wisdom and the love of God, the concern of God. And then he warned his followers. He warned his children. He said, don't be like that. Don't go after them. I hope that this has been refreshing for you to look at the traps they tried to set. And yet how Jesus' authority shines through. And I would be amiss to say that we don't sometimes struggle with that. Well, I don't like to pay taxes. Well, I don't understand the resurrection. I want to be married to my wife forever because I kind of do. But some people are like, I don't want to be married to my spouse forever. <laughs> like, some people like that teaching more than others. I don't know. But then there's people that they just, they don't get that God is, 
They just don't get the nature of God, and, and I don't fully understand it. But I, the more I know of God's nature, the more I hate my old nature, and the more I want of his nature. So I want to be like him. And so we see here, we're moving toward a wonderfully prophetic passage in chapter 21. A lot of things about the last days and also about AD 70 when uh, the Jews would be ransacked by the destruction of the Romans. But as we look at this, I hope that you're challenged to say, okay, Jesus has all the answers. I may not know the answer to this person's problem or even my own problems, but Jesus, I can't go wrong with him. So Father, we thank you that we can't go wrong with Jesus. Father, we thank you that you give us of your spirit, that we have no need that any man should teach us, but that you lead us into all truth and that your word confirms that you sent Jesus to be the savior of the world, that all authorities are subject to him. So Lord, we bow our knee and our hearts to you tonight. Jesus, you are the king. Lord, we thank you that you give us opportunity to live in the midst of a, a society where, yes, we have to pay taxes, but we get to know you. And we thank you, Father, that we get to look forward to heaven where we get to be with you forever. Jesus, we thank you that you show us how to respond and you, you responded masterfully to those who had mixed motives that, that were wicked in their intent. And I pray that you would protect us from wicked men and women, but rather that we would love them, that we would pray for them, that we would witness to them and show them that Jesus, you died in their place and all they have to do is be reconciled to you, come to you. All they have to do is believe on you and be saved. All they have to do is accept what you did on the cross. Lord, I thank you that we have the privilege to pay taxes. I thank you for the privilege of marriage on this side of earth, but more so the marriage that we get to have with you, Jesus, that the fact that we'll be sons and daughters of the King of heaven. And Father, I thank you that you are going to rule and reign one day on earth. You will set what is wrong right. You will establish a kingdom and you've already established that in our hearts as we trust in you. May we be faithful and may we uh, be steadfast like last week to be good stewards of the gifts you give us. May we invest them wisely, the time, the gospel, the talent, the treasure, and the fruits of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.